Uh, hey, y'all, it, it's Stephen Van Camp and Lewis, uh, and I'm here today uh, with Dr. John Finer, who is a retired, from, uh, a retired professor and soybean researcher who now spends most of his time uh, looking into orchids, propagating orchids, uh, flasking, breeding. He's, he's just, he's all in for orchids and, and, uh, he's got a, a really cool hardcore science-based channel, uh, called the plant propagator. And so it's the last time that John and I chatted, uh, we, we discussed the, the minimal benefits to maybe some, some, some dangers of, of, uh, hydrogen peroxide on orchid roots. And, and so I kind of want to continue that, that, sort of scientific theme. And, and so, so that's what we're going to discuss today. We've got kind of a wide range of topics that we're going to chat sort of household products um, that people can and do use on their orchids. But uh, John, I appreciate you being here and um, tell us quickly about yourself again. Well, Steve, thanks. Thanks for having me here. I've, I've enjoyed our, our conversations both um, through this format and, and in person. And uh, it, it's been real uh, real helpful and informative for me. So my background is in uh, plant sciences. I'm actually uh, trained as a plant biotechnologist. So I worked on uh, tissue culture, gene, gene transfer, gene expression, uh, mostly in soybeans over my career. Uh, I started, I did start dabbling a little bit with orchids uh, late in my career. I had people that came into my laboratory and wanted to do some flasking and I would charge them one, one or two of their flasks for the use of my laboratory. So that's how I, that's how I started into this with the, uh, the orchids. Uh, since retirement, I've gone, as you said, all in to orchids. Um, I'm in a laboratory here in Southwest Florida, and I I, I do a lot of um, breeding of orchids and flasking of orchids uh, myself. Uh, again, my main, I just want to make sure you know that, that my main area of expertise is in the laboratory, in the tissue culture and in the flasking. Uh, as far as growing orchids, I'm still learning, as I guess all of us are, uh, how, to, how to grow orchids and, and have them do well and dealing with some, some issues because of the, of the high temperature and humidity that we're, that we're having right now. But um, I, I do understand plants, uh, plant growth. I have a PhD in plant physiology, so I can I can perhaps uh, answer some questions or talk about things from a different perspective uh, from most other other people. But I just I want to go on the record and saying I'm um, I'm still learning how to how to grow orchids, and uh, I'm not the definitive person, but I'd be happy to contribute in any way I can. Yeah, yeah, that's those are all good points, and I appreciate the the background and, and, and the, the asterisks above your name that, that we're going to put. But, uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these sort of plant-based products that people use, you know, uh, not plant-based products, these products that people use on their plants, we're going to talk about in an orchid context, but I think a lot of this is transferable to, to a lot of other, a lot of other, um, uh, plant growing, whether it's, it's, it's in the garden and, and, um, and it, it seems like there's just a lot of myths out there and, and uh, I really want to pick your brain. And, and if, and if there's something that you're not entirely sure of that, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll explore it maybe at a later time or, or, or hypothesize about, about the effects of, of this, this particular product uh, currently based on your, your knowledge. But um, yeah, so, you know, you and I had exchanged some emails not long ago and, 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 the list of things is it's about a half dozen, and I figured we'd start with with the the easy ones, the sort of common ones that a lot of people <laughs> use. You know, uh, let's start off with rubbing alcohol. Um, you know, I, I, I've been on the record online, and, and even in, in it, even in our last discussion, that I'm not a huge fan of hydrogen peroxide, but it seems like rubbing alcohol has has a wide range of uses that that are actually practical for for growing orchids. Right. So it is, I mean, the, the rubbing alcohol, it's, um, you know, it's used a lot, obviously in the, you know, in the in medical trade, I use it in my laboratory to spray down and kind of surface clean things. Um, you know, what, what you need to, the only thing to remember about rubbing alcohol, well, when you go to the store and buy the stuff, there is, I think you can buy 70% and 91% uh, alcohol yeah. and, and 70% for some of the applications is, 
uh, preferred because 70% has better wetting capability. So it'll get into the cracks and crevices at the lower concentration. 70% um, may or may not burn, um, you know, if, if you have an application where you're, you're dipping, um, you know, an instrument in, in alcohol and burning at 70% might not burn, but 91% uh, will. So there are, but, but you have to, there's different applications for either. If you're looking to surface sterilize something, 70% is the way to go. The other thing that you should know is that, well, rubbing alcohol for, you know, don't consume it. Some people are sensitive to it. So if you spray it, if you inhale it, uh, that's not good to do a lot of that. You need to be you need to be aware of that. Um, rubbing alcohol is isopropanol. The alcohol that's in alcoholic beverages is ethanol. Those are two very different mm. compounds, different properties. Both are used for for surface sterilization, but they are very different. Do not consume. Do not inhale. Do not get much on you as possible. The the rubbing alcohol, the isopropanol. And you can use it for surface sterilization, but then after after it it evaporates, um, that's you know that's fine. Then you're then you're safe and everything's good. And, and see that that's that's interesting already. That that seventy percent is more useful than ninety percent because it's because of its its wetting properties. And and I would not have known that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, if you're at the store and you're, you know, looking at one or the other, you're like, well, I want to nuke this, these tools. So I'm going to go with the, the stronger stuff. So it's, that's already interesting that 70% is more useful than 90% for that application. Right. Um, what about for, for insect control um, for, let's say aphids or mealybugs, you know, spraying some, some on your plants, spot shots, right. I guess, as you, as it were. So I've, I've never done that. I can see how that would something like uh, aphids. Aphids are, you know, they're soft body and they're really easy to control. So you may be able to do that. You have to be careful. I would think that you have to be careful not to do that in the sun or when it's really hot, mm -hmm. uh, because what happened, you know, the alcohol is going to pull some of the water out. It may, it may burn your plants. You got to be a little bit cautious about that. Uh, mealybugs. So I often will take, um, you know, mealybugs and, and spraying is one thing. Um, but a lot of the applicate, a lot of my use of rubbing alcohol for insect control, I'll put a, I'll put it on a cotton swab mm. and then rub the, you know, like for example, the pseudobulb or the leaf, it's a way to both clean the leaf, um, get the debris off, but it's also a way to kill any, any insects and small organisms that are on there. So spraying, you got to be a little careful about that because you can overspray and cause damage and then get it to drip down on, you know, on the roots and the more sensitive parts of the plant. And it might be better to use kind of a, a cotton swab that's drenched with, um, you know, with alcohol to kind of clean off the, you know, the, the certain type of insects are a little bit better. But again, when you do that, you have to, as, as with many of it, it's a, it's a contact type thing. So you got to make sure that you get underneath and where some of these, some of the insects hide with, with mealybugs, especially they can get down in crevices and cracks and you got to do repeat applications to make sure that you get them all. And so maybe, maybe 70% is better than 90% for the same reason. It's going to travel into those small spaces a little easier. It, yeah, it may. But uh, again, I just uh, you just got to be careful. Don't saturate the plant too much so that it's dripping off of it. It's a contact type um, compound. So make sure that you if you spray it, just a light spraying is good. Um, and, and again, it's best to 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 use a, a cotton swab and try to both physically remove the insects that are there and and clean it so you get you get a couple of different things when you're using a cotton swab with the like i said you're right with the 70 percent ethanol and, and you you mentioned that that it can be dangerous to the plants because it can it can uh, take some of the water out as it evaporates that's how it kills as well right it just sort of like desiccates the the little critters yeah i i actually don't to be honest with you i don't know how the how the alcohol is you know how the alcohol acts i think it i think i mean it i think it is i think it burns in in certain you know certain ways and i think it is a, a dehydrant but there may be some other other properties to it i i should have looked this up i'm sorry i don't i don't know how it's why it's active the way that it is no worries um uh, the the other the final thing that that i've heard people talk about uh, online using alcohol for and i understand it's not a good idea is to clean your tools uh, to get rid of virus. But we had uh, the lady from Agdia come and speak to us when I lived in Austin years ago. And she said, no, 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 no. Alcohol does not kill all the viruses. 
really fire is your best your best killer of viruses do, do you know about right. that so with you, viruses you'll say so you'll get um you'll get different different opinions and different things from that um i think it's you know alcohol is better than nothing mm -hmm. okay um, and so uh, I think alcohol has some level of effectiveness and it may not be more for, it may not be as effective on viruses as for example, it, it is on, on other, other pathogens on fungi, mm -hmm. um, on bacteria. Certainly it's going to work to kill bacteria. Um, I've talked to a virologist about what's the, and, but not an orchid virologist. And mm -hmm. again, from my background, a soybean virologist, but I'm sorry, a virologist is a virologist. Is a, and so he knows how to kill viruses. And he, it, it was plant viruses, but it was soybean viruses. So he actually recommended um, bleach um, above alcohol. So bleach works better uh, than alcohol. So soaking your instruments in, in bleach. And there are problems with that as far as uh, potentially degrading, you know, is is taking metal instruments and soaking them for too long in a in bleach like material. So sure. bleach works better. And, and then at the top level, you know, torch, yeah, torch your instruments and get them, get them cooking well. But the, the virologist says, told me that, that bleach, and I don't remember if you said 20% or 50%, but he, he told me that bleach, and, and, but not just a dip, this is soaking your instruments in bleach is an effective way to kill the viruses. And oh, a virologist yeah. told, told me that. So, um, and the guy's pretty good. So I'm, I tend to believe him that, that bleach can be used uh, to effectively kill viruses on tools, but soaking the instruments rather than just dipping. Whereas, you know, when you flame an instrument, you gotta, you gotta flame it and you gotta let it cool. Yeah. But I think overall, it's going to be a little, little quicker. Cool. Good, good to know. Um, the, the next thing is, is cinnamon. You know, I've, uh, you know, I've used cinnamon for years on my orchid cuts. And then I stopped some years ago, um, not because I, I don't believe in the efficacy or the, the usefulness of cinnamon. I think I just ran out and I never bought more. Um, and, and then I, I realized that, oh, these plants are healing just fine without cinnamon, but I also don't have the crazy high humidity that y'all have in Florida. So, so what about, and the other thing that I want to ask you, um, is my understanding of cinnamon is that it's not an antifungal so much as it is a desiccant. So it makes the area hostile to the fungus, but it, it, you know, let's say you add water and then you, you douse your, your, your plant in water with cinnamon and it suddenly you remove the, the useful properties of the cinnamon. Is that, is that true to your knowledge? So, so, so cinnamon, I actually, I actually do not use uh, cinnamon. Um, okay. for, for any, any of the things that I, I do, um, I, and, and I, um, I've been a cinnamon skeptic If people ask me if I like cinnamon, I say, yeah, on, on, on cinnamon rolls and on bread. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but the, the reality of this is, so I did take a look before we met today, I did take a look at the scientific literature on this and there are people that have done, um, ext extractions of of cinnamon to and have shown that there are antifungal properties of water soluble extracted cinnamon so so there is um so, so there's something behind it uh that it may not be just a, as you say it may not be the desiccant it, that may contribute to it in some way um the, the thing is you talk with people and they use this for everything right. so it's an insecticide it's a viricide um, it's a antibiotic, um, but the, the, the literature that I found on this, it's, they use cinnamon extracts and they showed that the cinnamon extracts had antifungal properties. So okay. there is some benefit to it. I don't know at what level, um, you know, this, ah, it smells great. So <laughs> I, I, I think it's, I think it's fine to use this if you've been using it and you have success with it. And you can afford to use it. Actually, some of the fungicides are, are pretty expensive anyway. Um, but I think it's it's nice. I mean, a lot of people, from what I hear, they make you make paste. You don't just uh, make a suspension and spray it. They when you make a cut, you make a paste, and then you apply the paste to that. And I think that there's whatever properties are associated with it. Um, 
people have talked about it for years and said how well it works. And the scientific literature supports that, at least as an antifungal, uh, in, a, in a pretty decent way. So I, I, I am not, I'm not a cinnamon skeptic. I'm not quite, you know, as, as bad as I used to be. There are, um, there's valid literature that shows that it works, that it works. And there's lots of, you hear a lot of stories about how it works uh, as well. So if you're using it and you're uh, successful and you like the smell of it, keep, keep on going. Yeah. It, the, the, the science uh, supports it at least to some extent. And and you can use it in your food and drink too, which is a win. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right, John. So so the next thing is Epsom salts. You know, I, I know I've never used them. I, I know some people swear by them. And like you said, for <laughs> cinnamon, they use it just for for this. It's this miracle item that they use it in their garden. They'll use it on their orchids. That it it saves plants for for all kinds of reasons i don't use it i know actually bill toms who is is the bulba film god of the world essentially uh he absolutely swears by it and he says his he even goes so far as to say one of his keys to success is using it on a monthly basis and i like i said i've never used it i've never found the need for it but some people swear by it what what what, what do you think okay so here I knew you were going to ask me about that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So, um, so I I actually use this, and the reason that I use this, and part of it depends on how you grow your orchids and the fertilizer regime that you're do using, and what type of fertilizers you're using. All right. So, um, and, and Epsom salts just and and you know this. So this is um, it says on here. On the back of this right here, uh, it's magnesium sulfate. So this is just this is just magnesium and sulfate, and these are two um, two compounds that are essential for plant growth. All right, and the thing about this is, magnesium is readily available in the soil. Uh, it's usually readily available, but our orchids are not growing. Most of our orchids are not growing in the soil. They're growing either on mounts or in bark or or up in pots out of the way, and it's it's not soil. So so it's probably good to have um, magnesium. I use it for you know you don't so obviously it's not essential for you, but it's I like using it. All right. So when you look at the other fertilizers, I got to point to this one, and this is not an orchid fertilizer. But when you look at the back of this, yeah. and as far as the contents go, this is plant food. This is supposed to be a good plant food, but the reality of it is there's no magnesium in here, all huh. right? So it's not, so that doesn't contain magnesium. So if you're going to use something like this, look at the, look at the content, see if it contains magnesium. If it doesn't contain magnesium, it might not be bad to put some Epsom salts in with your fertilizer application. There are some other types of fertilizers. This is Orchid Plus. And the plus means there are certain added uh, microelements in there. And one of the things that's on here, and you go back to the back of this, mm -hmm. and one of the things that's added in here is magnesium sulfate. So this is, also, this is something else that I use, the Orchid Plus, but check to see what type of fertilizer you have and if magnesium is included. And it also depends on how you grow your orchids. Um, but I don't think it hurts to add a little bit of Epsom salts when you fertilize and it can only help. So I'm actually a user and supporter. I don't, it, it's, it's a micro element. You don't need to use it every time you fertilize or fertilize, but I think it's, I think it's useful. And I think it's really tough. You can burn your plants with overuse of, of epsom salts but i think it's tough to do and and then it gets into the ground and it binds really well to the soil in the ground after you water your plants and it washes washes off so i environmentally i don't think it's i think it's fine to to use it and i think in some cases it's in, in many cases it's going to be beneficial so i'm a user and a supporter of of epsom salts it, that's 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 all good to know. Um, so it, it kind of depends on on if it's in your existing fertilizer, 
as well as maybe using a little bit extra is it's not going to hurt anything and and that's for your orchids and maybe even in the garden yeah well in the garden you don't need it as much because like i said there's plenty of and there's a lot of chemicals there's a lot of compounds that are that are in the soil at pretty high levels that probably you don't need to add but when you're but your orchids because they're not in the soil Mm -hmm. uh, and because they're up and out at least most of mine are then it's then it becomes a little bit more important to think about uh adding these things oh interesting i think i have a little bag laying around somewhere that someone gave me maybe i'll maybe i'll actually throw (laughs) it in with the with the rest of them you could you could throw it you could do an experiment and do plus minus and see if you're See if your ones would do better or just it can't hurt, I don't think. But, you know, again, you you don't need a lot of it and and to add a little bit of it just to to help out. I don't yeah. know. See what it does. But if you're yeah, I've, I've watched your videos, man, your plants are your plants look great. So you might not need it. I but, don't know. But, you know, like but before the video that we're recording, you and I were talking about becoming an incrementally better grower. And and maybe maybe yeah. this is one of those little thing, maybe those little tweaks that can that can really help out. So maybe I'll. Maybe I'll, I'll work it into the mix. Yeah, maybe a lot more award winners coming out of your garden. Yeah, yeah, I'd, <laughs> I'd be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, John, I, I know that there's a, there's a probably a shrinking contingent of folks that use bloom boosters. Uh, although I, I, my understanding is that it can be quite a contentious um, thing to discuss <laughs> about why why it's not useful or needed in any orchid collection. What, uh, what are your thoughts on bloom boosters? Well, all right. So, so here is just so um, we can do a side by side here. All right. So here is the bloom booster right here. Here's the regular orchid formulation and what they describe it and what they say is right, right here. So this is just a really, um, a much it just has one and when you compare the numbers the npk numbers you can tell that see that the the p number goes way up so it's just got really high um phosphorus in there there, there may be some other um other bigger differences i haven't compared the two of these i think the nitrogen um nitrogen level is yeah the nitrogen level is way lower in 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 the bloom booster and so uh, you look at this and, and the, the question is, and, and actually, I don't know the, the answer to this. Does, you know, when the plant's blooming, does it require different levels of the same elements? Because that's what the bloom booster is doing. It's providing pretty much the same thing, just, just different, different levels. And, 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 but the main, the main reason is, is high, um, you know, high phosphate and lower nitrogen. And and they say in some cases that the potassium should be higher also in the bloom booster, but in these products they're they're pretty uh, similar. So I, I don't have a good answer to you. I I don't use it uh, personally. I know a lot of people that do, and they swear by it. Um, they, you know, it says it says better bloom on the package. So <laughs> sure, it's going to give you better blooms. Uh, and then when you got Bloom Booster, yeah. Um, but usually the people that use these products are they're fertilizing and they're taking care of their plants pretty well anyway. So, um, I, you know, I don't know. The other thing on here is that both of these containers say that they're um, it's endorsed by, you know, the American Orchid Society. But both of them say that. So uh, I, I don't know. You know, th- there's all different when you go to the store and you get, you know, just you know, lawn fertilizer for different types of grasses, different times of the year, when you get all these other different types of fertilizers, you know, you compare this mm. uh, to this, you know, there's different levels. And and even in the orchid world, you can find orchid specific fertilizer. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about Michigan State fertilizer that everyone thinks is just golden, but it's just regular fertilizer. Um, you know, we can do that too. Um, and and you're looking at different levels. And if it works for you, that that's fine. I I do not because I've got so many orchids that I treat all the same way. I don't pull the ones out that are blooming and treat them any differently. Uh, it it I, I just don't do that from a technical standpoint. It it's just is going to be too much work. I just 
fertilize all of my orchids the same way um, all at once. There are different potting mix. There, there are different parts of shade and in my garden. But for fertilizer application, I just treat them with all the same fertilizer and I use the same thing um, most of the, the year. So for me, um, you know, I, I just I just apply the fertilizer. Usually when you apply these fertilizers, just, you know, when you know, you, you know, when you water an orchid, uh, in most cases you water it and it just it blows right through because the porous potting mix or when you spray the roots and it just most of it you know, 90, 95, 99% of the fertilizer solution just drops off anyway. It goes right through the medium. Um, and, and so usually you kind of overdo it and and it's going to be um, fine with just any kind of fertilizer, anything that's there. You know, I, I was at a meeting yesterday, at a working meeting yesterday, where they talked about what happens naturally. So in nature, what kind of fertilizers do these orchids get? Well, they, they get rainwater, they get whatever's, you know, on the tree that they're mounted to, whatever's in the ground for terrestrials that they're on. Uh, and certainly fertilizer is going to give you better, better growth and it's going to give you more blooms. But the question is, how much can you manage this to give you precise growth under different conditions? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't no, to be very honest with you. And, and I think as long as you're applying some level of fertilizer, I think you're good. I, I'm going to turn this around. Do you, you use Bloom Booster on, on your I, orchids? I, I have. I never have. In, in, in 30 years of, of growing orchids, I, I haven't ever used Bloom Booster. Um, I, you know, I think originally it was the same reason that you described. Like I have this like whole menagerie of of different orchid species and, and hybrids and whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and just tailoring, like giving a different plant, a different fertilizer, never, never appealed to me. So maybe I didn't take it up because I was too lazy to individually spot check every single one of my, my orchids. And it turned out to, to work just fine. But my understanding is that the bloom booster originally became a thing for orchids for epiphytic orchids you know 50 60 100 years ago when they were hitting their orchids with the same fertilizer that they were using on corn and soybeans so it was really strong really really strong with crazy amounts of nitrogen and so they found that the the, the bloom booster what they thought triggered blooming by increasing the you know the 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 phosphorus and it turns out that not only is that not true it it was actually the reduction of the nitrogen in the bloom booster that was triggering the fertilizer and allowing the plant to bloom so it was the reduction of the nitrogen allowing the plant to bloom instead of the phosphorus triggering the plant to bloom and so if you just if you have a, a single fertilizer that maybe MSU or a balanced or whatever, you grow big plants, they're happy, have enough nutrients, and then they put out a great bloom. And, and that that's that's why folks like me were maybe too lazy to, to uh, use Bloom Booster have found success without utilizing it. Okay. One other, I mean, one other comment, I'm not sure whether we talked about this last time, but the Michigan State MSU fertilizer, uh, you know, people say that this is, this is great developed for orchids. It's wonderful stuff. And it, and, and it's fine. Um, it's, you're, you're going to pay a lot more <laughs> for the MSU fertilizer, but the reality of it is, and I've looked at the literature on this, the MSU fertilizer was not developed for orchids. It was developed for the plants that were growing in the MSU Green, Michigan State University greenhouses at the time. And it's just standard. It's a couple of different uh, formulations that were based on what type of water they were mixing it with. So it's not designed for orchids. Hmm. It worked, you know, it's better than nothing. So if you're not using anything, go use the Michigan State University uh, fertilizer, but it it really wasn't designed for that. And I, I don't see any advantage of using that over really any other, any other fertilizers that are out there. So I just wanted to bring up that point of clarification because it does get a lot of attention for completely unwarranted reasons. I, I, I totally agree. When, when people ask me about fertilizing, I just say, whatever's on sale buy that it, it's probably <laughs> going to work just fine 
And then I'll even take it one step further. You know, you're not supposed to use urea based fertilizers for orchids. And uh, one one of the best growers that I knew in Austin, she Monica ha has the most awards probably in the city of Austin, and she's just been using Miracle Grow her whole her whole orchid growing career with the urea yeah. based and, and nobody she didn't get that message and neither did her plants so I, <laughs> I think you're right that the type of fertilizer is is probably the one of the least important aspects of your your growing care yeah. that 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 triggers amazing blooms yeah you know it's, it's interesting people always they're always looking for the magic bullet and, and, and what you talked about earlier, it's, it's just, it's so many, it's a, you know, a combination of different things. It's like, yeah, fertilizer is great. It doesn't matter which one, um, you know, it's one of the other things is, is as, um, you know, I looked into one compound that people in my work society love talking about, and I'll, I'll bring it up. Do you, do you use super thrive? For I, I do not. I, I, I prefer <laughs> to get my, um, What's I'm sorry I'm blanking on on the root triggering hormone. Uh, it's oxins. oxins it's yes. uh, naphthalene acetic acid. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I use kelp max or uh, yeah. yeah I use kelp max so that's where I get it from. I I've never found super thrive to be particularly useful and but still very expensive. <laughs> Yeah. And, and so that's one of those other things that people swear by mm -hmm. and, and it contains uh, vitamin B1, which is which is thiamine. And it can, contains a small amount of uh, naphthalene acetic acid, which is a plant growth regulator where too much of, a, of, of either of these compounds and you'll but more the NAA, the naphthalene acetic acid, your, your plants are they'll, they'll die. So yeah. you got to be careful with application. And again, look, you know, you only add drops, but people swear by this stuff is a, is a great nutrient and hardly anything in it and yeah. <laughs> and you got to be careful with it too so it, it's another one of these compounds that you know that people talk about but it, you know it, it's a it's it's more you know it's more light and humidity and um you know and water and and yeah fertilizer but more plus or minus and and there's um, but people are always looking for the one magic thing you need to try that you need to dump this in your you know, in your nutrient or add this over the top of your plant or something like that. And, yeah. and it's just so many, as you said, so many small things that can contribute to, to really optimum growth. Yeah, absolutely. You okay. had mentioned uh, in, in our emails that you were interested in talking about garlic and banana extracts. I'm, I'm curious to hear what, <laughs> what you've got on those. So there's a lot, you know, on, on YouTube, uh, you just see so many, if you, and don't do this, but you, you look on, you know, garlic or banana and orchids and you'll get so much, you'll get so many videos. So what, what people do is they take, you know, they take the banana and they take, and they take the garlic, garlic, and they make extracts of these things. And just, I mean, and, and what, it, these are magical and they take <laughs> these things and they extract it and you can either one, I mean, and there's, there's, and I'm sure you can do really any kind of extraction. And some people even, it's interesting with the banana that they say that it's the peel. So it's what you throw out, do an extraction of the peel. Um, and the reality of it is that there's, I, I can't see how there's going to be anything in the peel that's going to be useful. Now, in my laboratory, I do use the, the pulp uh, to generate orchid, really optimum orchid seedling growth. And I tried mm -hmm. banana baby food and bananas based on a uh, recommendation uh, from, from Fred Clark. Uh, but this goes way back in the literature. And there's actually a, a uh, there's some old articles by Joe Arditi, who was given the researcher award for AOS this past year, where he talked about adding banana. Again, this is in culture. These are, this is not, not on their, your plants. Yeah. Um, but he, he, he seemed to think that it was a a water insoluble compound that was in the banana pulp that was contributing in some way to orchid seedling growth. Now, people have gone beyond this and they say that you use this or they they actually take, a, I've seen videos where they'll, 
they'll kind of take a banana and shove a phalaenopsis into it. And then magically there'll be roots growing <laughs> throughout the banana uh, inside huh. it, or you'll take a garlic and you'll grind it up and you'll make an extract. And then you'll put your same thing, phalaenopsis in with a garlic and the, and the roots on these fowls grow like, grow like crazy. Um, and, and I'm not, so there is, so, so this has, uh, like other things, it, it does have some antimicrobial capabilities that have been referenced in the literature. So garlic is it does it does have some of those properties, and banana has some growth promoting issues with orchids in in flasks and in tissue culture. But as far as using these compounds uh, on your orchids, um, <laughs> I, I I can't I I don't know the benefit. But again, I've heard people. And I've even heard people in my local orchid society that just swear by using, it's essentially take the peel, you throw it in with water, you let it soak overnight for two days, and that's what you water your orchids for. And and I, I just don't see much, I don't see much benefit, you know, use, use this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're, but, but again, when you're confronted with people that have, that have nice orchids, and they're so enthusiastic about this. Uh, it's hard to just blow them off and say no. I'm 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 not going to do that. But um, you know, use use the proven orchid fertilizers that have all that have a good good balance that you can buy that have a good balance of things rather than extracting this or, or this and 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 using that. It's these I think are mostly used to to get get views on videos um, yeah. rather than um, any any reality uh, rooted in science. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's, that's the whole point of, of what we're trying to do today. And then the last time is sort of, sort of maybe untangle some of these, you know, uh, or demystify or remove the magic from some of these bullets, I think that are, are, are out there that if you do this, your plants will look like this and, 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 and maybe add, maybe be the Debbie Downer that sort of brings everybody back to reality a little bit, but yeah. at the same time, I mean, experimenting is important to, 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 to growing orchids. And it's, it's just finding the balance between the experimentation and then just jumping on the bandwagon that you see on, on TikTok or on, on YouTube or, or wherever, you know, and it's, it's, it's figuring all that stuff out that can be interesting to say the least. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a good point. And I, I enjoy the, uh, the advantage that I have is that I've, I've been a, you know, a plant scientist for, you know, for, for many, many years. And I've, uh, I've taken classes back many, many years ago and I taught classes in, you know, in mineral tr nutrition and, and plant growth and development and things like that. So I have, I have kind of an understanding of how the plants are, are growing. So I have kind of advantage of that when I, when I hear these things and I see these things, I go, jeez, but, but <laughs> many people don't have that similar background and they're going to yeah. be drawn in when you see these, you know, these, these incredible pictures of these plants and how well they're growing. And, and some of which are, are faked even, um, you know, it, it's hard to just ignore those things uh, when, when, when people are so convincing and you see them, but it, it's, it's a challenging, it's a challenging thing to, to deal with. I, you know, I, I agree. We do the best we can. Yeah, for sure. It's, you know, with, with the amount of information that we, we have in social media, it's, it's like, drinking from a fire hose it's just all this information you gotta like you gotta filter out what's yeah. what's good and what's not and you know ho hopefully we're able to help folks that are watching this right right i hope so too hope i was able to to help and clarify a few things and, and before before we wrap up i, I do want to say that everybody watching needs to check out your channel the plant propagator um like i said it, there's a lot of really cool science stuff in there and uh, it's a really, a really interesting channel with, with great tips and tricks and, and, and blooms to show. And you are, you are a flasking maniac. You're out there breeding all <laughs> kinds of orchids and, and making kind all kinds of babies. It's really cool. Well, appreciate, appreciate the plug and I'm, in, I'm enjoying myself and uh, it's, it's not boring science. I try to, I try to make it interesting and, and relevant and uh, I, I just, I have fun. I'm retired. I just, I try to have fun in many of the things that I do and, and I hope it shows in my videos. I think it does. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And uh, again, I want to thank you for, for, for joining me and, and chatting and, and, and 
hopefully dispelling some of these myths and, and providing another feather in the cap to folks who are trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work in, in their orchid collection. All right. You're, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it. All right. Good, good to see you, John. Talk later. All right. All right. See you, Steve. Bye.